that we have embarked on a journey to follow Jesus and to be like him. And that's why you are called disciples. And we greet you as disciple makers because we are reminding you and us that we are not only to be like Jesus and follow Jesus, but we also make others disciples as well. Only when the whole church are embarked together on this journey of discipleship, then we can be a vibrant church because when you stay close to Jesus, you can't help but be passionate, you can't help but be vibrant, you know. So we are journeying together as disciple makers of um, Jesus Christ. Today I wanna share with you on the message of mentoring relationship. Actually, this is a message that I was sharing with the 50 plus ministry. As you know, we have a 50 plus ministry on Saturday where the 50 and older individuals from our church will come together and learn and grow. And this is one of the challenges that we gave them and really encourage the uh, middle age and older to be willing to open up their hearts and share and journey with the younger generation, um, those who are less mature in Christ. The more mature ones will take their hands and uh, walk together in this whole process. So when Pastor Terrence, uh, a pastor of family ministry, heard about that, he said, you know, Pastor Albert, can you share that in all three congregations as we begin the family month so that everybody on the same page as a foundation for the ministry that we wanna to grow together as we talk about intergenerational mentoring, intergenerational ministry, and growing together as a church family. So that's the kind of uh, background as we come and share this message to you. You know, by now, by now, most likely, um, you have done some aspects of mentoring, whether knowingly or unknowingly. And by now, uh, you may uh, never had a mentor in your life, uh, but most likely um, you have been mentored directly or indirectly in your life. Because no man can be an island, no woman can be an island. We all grow in the context of relationships. And that relationships are significant ones and people who pour their lives into your lives to help you grow and to help you mature. So mentoring, uh, can also be called discipleship, actually. They're the same thing. Uh, mentoring is teaching, actually. Uh, it is parenting. Uh, it is coaching, a more a, a contemporary term that we are so used to, especially in the business community. Or oh, we talk about in the faith journey together, uh, we share lives together, they're all about mentoring. And a true mentor walks with their mentees and helps them to go further than they could have gone by themselves. And that's why mentoring is so um, significant. Like Jesus taking the 12 disciples to stay with him, to pray together, to serve together, and prepare them for his departure and gave them the great commission. Uh, like uh, Moses who took Joshua under his wing for 40 years and observed him and do things together with him to prepare him to take over the mantle of leadership when Moses departed from this world. Like Elijah taking Elisha under his wing, prepare him to take up that prophetic role uh, to speak God's word to Israelites when he was taken up by the chariots of fire, um, he prepared him. Like Paul, who mentored many, many people, including Timothy, and to prepare him to be a good pastor by taking him along the missionary trips, teaching him all the skills and, and the hearts of a pastor to prepare him to be a pastor effectively in the early church. That's mentoring. And we see mentoring happens a lot through discipleship, through coaching, through teaching, uh, through parenting, and through sharing lives together as a church. But this morning, I just want to give you an example of how it looks like um, in, a, in mentorship. Uh, in Acts chapter 18, verses 24 to 28. Acts 18, 24 to 28. It's not working. Uh, next slide, please. Acts 18, chapter 24 to 28. An example of mentoring relationships. Okay? Uh, turn the Bible to there. I, I didn't print the, the, the scriptures on the uh, uh, PowerPoint. It's in your cell phone or in your uh, Bible. 
Acts chapter 18, verses 24 to 28, it says, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, he came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. Here we see a man who has potential. I mean, definitely Apollos has potential, right? The Bible says he was eloquent and and he was competent in the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. And then the Bible says he was instructed, he has been trained by someone in the way of the Lord. He understands the gospel. The way in Acts of the Apostle has been used as 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 a way to describe people who follow the way to the one who claim I am the way the truth and the life that's Jesus Christ so when it says he has been instructed in the way of the Lord they're saying that you know these are the people who are gospel centered people disciples and he was fervent in spirit he was passionate he was ready to go and do things for Jesus Christ and he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus so he knows Jesus he knows Jesus gospel though though he knew only the baptism of John that's the only inadequacy unfortunate shortcomings of Apollos you know if you look at the qualification of this man um, many churches will take him in as a youth pastor as an associate pastor right Uh, He's a wonderful, gifted, young man, individual. And he was courageous. In verse 26 says, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. To speak in the house churches of Jesus' time is different from speaking in a synagogue because synagogue are the congregation of the Judaism who are not very friendly to the way, who are not friendly to the disciples of Jesus Christ. And... He was courageous enough to speak in a synagogue. I mean, you have all these good qualities of this man, but he only understand the baptism of John. What do you mean by that? I mean, he's been instructed in the way of the Lord. He knows the way, the truth, and the life. And what do you mean by he only understand the baptism of John? I mean, scholars, New Testament scholars has been debating on that back and forth and back and forth, and there's really no very clear conclusion of that. But we know that he was inadequate. He was not complete. He was not perfect in his way, in his understand of God's thing. And you know what? For some of you, for some of us, that's your focus only. That's all you're focused about. That's all you care about. Inadequacy, shortcomings, shortfalls. And sometimes we focus on that shortcoming so much that it eclipses all the good things, all the advantages, all the strength of that individual. Because this is the shortcomings, the weakness that really bothers us. And that becomes magnified as we look at Apollos. But not when you are a mentor. Not when you are a mentor. In verse 26, it says, But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So we see Aquila and Priscilla, they invested in Apollo's life to coach him, to mentor him, to disciple him, to help him to be more accurate in the way of God. How did they do it? First, they heard him. They heard him in the synagogue. They know his strength. They also know his shortcomings. They heard him. See, before you disciple, before you mentor people, you need to hear. You need to hear not only the audible voices, you need to hear the inaudible voices, the unspoken words. You need to hear words that is conveyed by the body language. You need to, word, you need to read between the lines sometimes. You need to hear the emotions being expressed they all convey a message to you. Some people get it, some people just don't get it. But to be a mentor, you got to hear those voices expressed. And secondly, they invited him, they took him aside and tried to correct him. 
they didn't do it publicly. Uh, they were doing it in such a way in privacy so that they are able to be more receptive to the teaching of a mentor. And thirdly, he explained, they explained the way of the Lord more adequately. It was an explanation to give rationales, to give understanding. It was a dialogue. It was a communication so that they can both really be convinced of the way that is more accurate. And then finally, the Bible says, after they have done that, in verse 27, And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. He greatly helped the believers. And verse 28, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. So after he was being coached, mentored by Aquila and Priscilla, he had a better understanding and more accurate understanding of the way of the Lord. Then he was released. He became more powerful. Uh, he had a greater potential to be expressed to the Christians. The Bible says he greatly helped them to grow in Christ, to go deeper in disciples, to go deeper in God's word. And then also to the unbelievers, because he was able to powerfully refute the Jews in public. He, he was engaged in debates and trying to help them to see that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And then he was released and blessed to be given a greater platform to bless others. And that's an example of mentorship. Everybody has potential, but none is perfect like Apollos. And there are individuals who are willing to take them under the wings, take them aside, talk to them, listen to them, engage in a communication process, helping them to be more complete, more mature, more accurate in the teaching of God's word and release them to do greater things for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's mentoring relationships. And today, as we begin the family months preaching, we want to encourage our church, everybody, to open up yourself to share your life uh, with younger generation, with those who are new in the faith uh, with individuals who are willing to be coached and to be mentored and grow together in Christ so that we can be disciple makers of Jesus Christ. The next slide, please. Thank you. What is the definition of mentorship? I take this from Pastor Edmund Chan and the rest of the outlines. I, I learned a lot from him. Pastor Edmund Chan is a pastor in, from Singapore. Uh, he pastor Covenant Evangelical Free Church. Uh, he's been doing mentorship for many, many years, over 30 years. Uh, he mentored pastors. He mentored his own pastoral staff. Uh, he mentored bishops, and he mentored uh, leaders of different denominations. Uh, he mentored CEOs of Christian corporations. Uh, he has a huge experience in this area, and I learned a lot from him, and this is the definition. Uh, mentorship is the empowering life investment in an accountable relationship through which knowledge, skills, and attitude are effectively modeled and imparted so that lives are transformed. What do you mean by that? Uh, let's take it apart, okay? The next slide. Okay, empowering life investment. It is to add something positively onto someone. It is sharpening that individual. It is an empowering life investment. And the second point, it is in an accountable relationship. See, if you don't inspect, they don't respect. If you don't have finals, people don't take their studies seriously. If you don't have deadlines, chances are we procrastinate. Most of us would do that, right? So it is an accountable relationship where we keep each other on the path of growth as we grow together to follow Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, uh, as we unpack, it says, through which knowledge, skills, and attitudes. It's not just classes, instructions, or programs, 
or training, but perspectives, how God sees things, and how we receive the value based in God's word. It is more than just imparting knowledge, but a whole being. And then number four, and it is being effectively modeled and imparted. That's the key. That's the key in mentorship. If you do not model it, it will not happen. If you do not show it, they, won't, they don't get it and they are not convinced. See, you can't mentor people what you don't have. If you are not reading your Bible, you can't mentor another person and read your Bible while you are not reading. You can't mentor a person and say prayer is such an essential spiritual discipline in Christian walk and disciples of Jesus Christ. If you don't pray, your mentees don't pray either. You can only disciple what you have. You can only mentor what you have. And that's why it's so essential that it is effectively modeled, then it can be imparted. And then number five, for the purpose, so that lives are transformed. And that's the unpacking that definition. Lives are transformed, changed for the better, to be more like Christ. That's the goal of mentoring. And as we move to the next one, I just want to share with you the next slide. Thank you. The importance of mentoring. Okay. Uh, just give you share four thoughts. Many, many good things, but four thoughts. One, uh, number one, mentoring changes lives. When you are engaged in a discipleship, mentoring, coaching relationship, life transformation happens more frequently, more effectively. You know why? Because you are inspired by someone, someone who are more mature, who has attained a higher uh, role, a higher standard in spirituality, a higher role in intimacy with Christ. It inspires you to excel to that level because someone inspires you. And secondly, they point you to resources that you may not know. They have gone through lives and spiritual lives to understand their resources who are able to help you. Okay? And thirdly, it becomes a support system. You see, when you are by yourself, you are less motivated to go beyond yourself. You are less motivated to go beyond the comfort zone, right? But when you are in a support system, in a coaching relationship, it changes life in a much more effective and conducive way. And secondly, mentoring helps the mentor to grow. Mentoring helps the mentor to grow because you have to grow. Because you have to grow with the mentees. Because you have to grow in order to give. Because you can't give out of emptiness. You can only give out of your abundance. You have to grow. So when you mentor someone, you can't help but to grow. And thirdly, mentoring expands that leadership base. Mentoring asks for higher expectations and higher outcomes. You bring them to a higher level. You are stretching that individual and to be stronger in faith and in Christ. And as a mentor, you are a leader. Leader begets leader. And when you mentor someone, you are basically expanding the leadership base of the church for us to do ministries and expand ministries to serve others and to bring others into God's kingdom. And number four, mentoring is the most worthwhile investment. Why? Because first of all, you are investing in people. When you invest in people, you talk about potential. People has potential. People has creativity endowed by the creator within them. People have the ability to multiply and to bless and to enrich. When you invest in people, you are investing in multiplication. And secondly, why mentoring is the most worthwhile investment? It, when you do that, you are leaving a legacy. When we are gone, we are gone. But you can leave a legacy before you go. You can leave a legacy before you go back to the Father so that lives can be transformed and others can, speak, can be inspired to grow in the Lord. 
Okay, the next slide, I'm going to share with you the seven principles of mentoring. Again, this is taken from Pastor Edmund Chan. He has many, many years of experiences, and he just basically condenses it into the seven principles, okay, and share that as a reminder. Okay, first of all, mentoring is more about being than doing. If you ask most people who has been mentored, what do you remember about your mentor? You ask all the mentees, right? You, you've been mentored by someone. What do you remember about him? Most of us do not focus on the skills, on the instructions uh, that has been handed down. Most of you will tell them, you know what? He is a man of integrity. You know what? He's a man of character. You know what? He has convictions. You know what? He is passionate about Jesus. You know what? He has courage. And you know what? He really persevered through life. I mean, it was tough, but he never gave up. He's been tested by fire. He's been broken, but he bounced back by the grace of God. He sacrificed. He has wisdom. He's gracious, man. I love this man. Most of the mentees will focus on that individual as a person than on what he has done and what he has instructed you. So when you do mentoring, when you do coaching, when you do discipling, when you do parenting, focus on the being part because that's what people remember and that's what is impactful. And secondly, uh, be selective. Sometimes we are uh, afraid that, you know, how do I do that, you know, and, and, and who should I mentor and what, what would work. Uh, You've you got to be selective. Find the right person, like-minded individual. Uh, some people do it because, you know, it's kind of a codependency. They just want to lean on you. Uh, others doing that because they want to brag about, you know, who is my mentor? He is so and so and so, you know, just to brag about. Uh, others, uh, they, they want to do mentoring because it's trendy. Well, everybody's doing that. I better find a mentor too. They are not quite ready. You need to find and be selective about someone. See, many people, they want to be mentored, but they are not ready to learn. They need to unlearn first before they can learn, because they can be taught and can be mentored. Find those who are ready. Find those who have the capacity to receive things. Find those who are willing to learn. There's a hunger to learn and grow and then you will work more effectively. And thirdly, uh, aim for value change. So when we mentor, when we coach, when we do parenting, don't set more rules. Don't just focus on behavior modifications. Christians, don't do this, don't do this, we don't do this, we don't do that, we don't do this, we don't do that, okay? Those are wonderful, it helps, it gives an indication, but you know what? You want them to want to do it. You want them to, to look at things from the eternal perspective to understand the value, the eternal value. Then when the heart and the mind and the perspectives are being reshaped by God's word and when they begin to grow, they do it because they really want it. That... I want to live a holy life. It's not just because as a Christian, I should be holy. I want to live a holy life because I want to be like Christ. Because holiness is so, so freeing. Because holiness is such a wonderful intimacy with Jesus Christ, with my Lord. I want that, I yearn for that. Even though in the flesh, oftentimes I stumble, I fall. But you know what? Every time I get up again, I yearn for holiness. I want holiness. Not because I'm a pastor, not because I'm a disciple, not because I'm a Christian. That in itself is not enough. You aim for value change. And number four, the heart of mentoring is modeling. As Jesus was walking one day in John chapter 1, when John the Baptist pointed the disciples to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. 
and they begin to follow Jesus and ask Jesus, where do you live? And Jesus said what? In chapter 1, verse 39, John, come and see. Come and see for yourself. Come and see if I'm the Lamb of God. Come and live with me and see for yourself. That modeling is such a powerful way of conveying a message in picture in life. The heart of mentoring is modeling. As Jesus washed the feet of disciples, and before he talked about love each other, he washed the feet, and then he said, love each other as I have loved you. Whoa. It's a double blow into the message. The impact and the effect of that message is right there from your ear and from your eyes. They add up to a powerful impact on the lives of the disciples when you see that. The heart of mentoring is modeling. You know, I've been trying to talk to people about reading through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And I, I uh, recently talked to someone from a Kansas congregation. And I said, Did you read through the Bible uh, in your whole life? No. It's, it's great to read through the Bible, you know, uh, from Genesis to Revelation. At least you know what's in and out, the whole thing, you know. Uh, when you share the gospel, people say, you, know, you talk about the Bible. Have you ever read the Bible? Yeah, the whole thing, uh, not there yet, you know. Maybe you felt a little bit challenged by that. So I said, why don't you read through the Bible? And so I asked them to take, take up the, uh, this app, uh, version. You can, uh, different plans in there, one-year plan, uh, six-month plan, three-month plan and say, why don't you sign up for that? And let's encourage each other to read through the Bible. So this couple, they took up the challenge. And then they asked me, what about you? <laughs> what about you? Oh, I said, I did that too. I read through the Bible every three months. That's my plan. So every year I read through the Bible four times. Because I want to know God's word. I want to be familiar with God's word. I want to be saturated with God's word in my mind, in my thinking, so that I can grow in Christ. Uh, not just prepare sermons, but I want to grow in Christ. So I read through the Bible four times a year, every three months, every three months, every three months. So I say, I read through it every three months. Uh, you read through it once a year, right? I go to set the example. Then they were like, oh, okay, I'll do that. That's a power of modeling, that if you don't do it, you can't expect your mentees to follow. It can be Bible reading, it can be prayer, it can be something else. But the core, the heart of mentoring is modeling. I can't emphasize more than uh, on that. And, and fifth is practice the presence principle. You need to practice the presence principle to be with him. Jesus called the disciples to be with him. If you want to mentor someone, you want to pray on your kids, you can't do it remotely. You got to be there. That when you see each other eye to eye, you see the whole person, you see the body language, you hear the tone of voice, you hear the hesitation, you hear like, ah. You begin to read things. You begin to read and understand that person. You begin to look at that person and wondering where uh, is he or her in her walk with the Lord. You got to be there in order to grow together and spend time together. And number six, you go to mentor holistically. You know, some mentoring relationships are Bible study. Uh, that's really a Bible study group. Uh, some mentoring relationships, they come together for counseling. Uh, I have this issue, I have that problems. Can you help me? And then you solve the problems. That's really counseling sessions. And those are wonderful. We need that. But as a mentor, you want to mentor holistically. There are three areas you got to have in a mentoring relationship. One spiritual disciplines everything goes back there okay your relationship with god understand god's word prayer life and grow together in christ spiritual discipline you hold each other accountable to spiritual discipline you know what everything we talk about christian life you always go back to the basic do you know god's word do you obey god's word do you live god's word do you love Jesus? Do you believe that he will come again? Do you believe that you and I will leave this world someday? It is as basic as that. Because if you believe all this, it will change your life. 
you will live differently. You always go back to the basics, spiritual discipline. And secondly, you got to help them to grow a Christian worldview. We are shaped by different worldviews as we go through life. But you want to inculcate Christian worldview in that individual, in that mentee, so that they look at things from God's perspective. What is God's perspective on the unrest? around the world today what is God's perspective on human selfishness today what is God's perspective on the me too movement what is God's perspective on the issues of life Christian worldview will help them to see things biblically you need Christian discipline you need Christian worldview and thirdly you need to grow them in leadership skill how to manage your time, how to prioritize, how to make the best out of your resources. These are the things that you need to have to mentor holistically for a mentee. And finally, number seven is to pray regularly because you and I cannot factor change. We can't effect change. We can only create that ground for the Holy Spirit to work, for God's word to instruct, and for them to encounter Jesus then transformation begin to happen you got to pray for your mentees regularly all the time then they will grow and the next slide I'm going to share with you some practical guidelines um, first of all keep keep a mentoring journal keep a mentoring journal uh, I, I coach the pastors they meet with me uh, sometimes once every you know bi-weekly others meet with me once a month and I keep a simple journal for each of them in each encounter just to keep track of their growth and to keep track of the topics and subjects we talk about and then we know how to move forward and grow together so keep um, a mentoring journal and secondly set expectations at the very beginning sometimes you feel like I, if I engage in a mentoring relationship then I can't back out I feel awkward to say no, I can't continue. So what do we do? Okay, set expectations at the very beginning. Decide mutually on the frequency. How many times do we meet? Uh, on, on the duration, how many hours do we meet when, whenever we come together? Once a month, two hours? Uh, the format. What is the format? Want to start with the Bible, a books, or with individuals, uh, just share lives and talk about life story? When do we end? One year? Okay, and then we evaluate whether we want to continue. If not, we just break one year right then. Uh, what about confidentiality? Okay, do we expect confidentiality when we get together and talk about the subject? Okay, you, you just set expectation at the very beginning so that there's no pressure for either one to move on or to go separate way or to look for other mentors and mentees in your life. And thirdly, uh, you want to find a mentor yourself. If you want to mentor other people, find a mentor yourself. If you want to be a parent, you know, find another parent to parent you, to help you to grow as a parenting so that others can enrich you and can enrich your kids. Find a mentor yourself. And as we look at our church and as we grow together, as we deepen our faith uh, uh, together as disciple makers, we just want to encourage our congregation to be open, to be willing to Engage in mentoring relationship. As a family, you can begin from your family that you can start mentoring your children. And for some of you, I will encourage you to mentor your spouse, mentor your wife. As men of God, as a head of the household, you set example, not only be the breadwinner, but you are also the spiritual leader of your family. Uh, it would be wonderful that you can mentor your children and mentor your spouse for the whole family to grow together to be like Jesus Christ. See, we can't, as pastors, we can't be there all the time for your family members. We see them once a week or twice a week or the most three times a week, but you are with them 24-7 practically. You are the best mentors of your family. And Pastor uh, Terrence has been emphasizing that over and over again. You are the best disciple makers. You are the best mentor of your family members. Help us by doing that. And secondly, as the church of Jesus Christ, um, we want our deacons and officers and pastors and Sunday, Sunday school teachers and small group leaders uh, to mentor and coach 
others to be able to do that so that you can pass on the work, so they can share the load and grow together as a church. You know, as I conclude, I just want to share with you. Last week, I went to see my mentor. My, my mentor is close to 80 years old. Uh, he is not a pastor, but he's a very uh, experienced uh, churchman uh, in Christ. Um, I have great respect for him. Um, I want to learn from him. So he was willing to take me in as a mentee. Uh, we don't always meet like once a month, but we try to meet as uh, often as we need and as we can. Um, recently, our conversation goes like this. I said, uh, Brother Son, so uh, can you help me? Uh, this year, I'm turning 60. I never lived as a 60-year-old and moving towards 70. Okay? This journey of my life is, is, is new to me. Can you teach me? Can you prepare me? Can you remind me? What does it look like to be 60-something as a Christian? Um, emotions. What kind of emotions would I experience? Um, temptations. What kind of temptations would I encounter? Uh, my walk with God. How does it look like for a 60-something person to walk with Jesus? Okay. How do I finish well in the 60s? Uh, what are the kind of challenges that I might be facing? Uh, can you share with me your life? And, and I was so grateful that he just opened up his life to me and share very deeply, and sometimes even in tears, about how he walked his life as a man of God, uh, sometimes struggling, other times triumphs, um, overcoming hurdles and obstacles, uh, knowing his limitations, uh, and yet trying to his best to, to, to be a, a disciple of Jesus Christ. He, he shared for an hour and a half. I was listening, I was engaging the whole process. And you know what, in conclusion, he said, Albert, just remember, all those things, all that I share with you, just remember, it can be summarized in this phrase, it is by the grace of God, brother, it is by the grace of God. And that phrase becomes the model of my 60 years old experience. Remember, it is by the grace of God. Not that you have accumulated 60 years of experiences and achievement that can you bring you through the 60 something. No. It is by the grace of God. Grow deep in Christ. Trust God. Walk with God. Stay close to Him. It will take you through 60 something. And that was His message to me. And it was such a liberating reminder for me. I hope you have that as well. I hope you have someone in your life that can speak like that to you as well. And I hope that for others, you can speak something as wise as my mentor to someone who needs that reminder so that all of us, the whole church, can grow together in mentoring relationship on our journey to be like Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you will inspire us to consider mentorship, coaching, parenting, teaching, so that we can be a blessing to others as we multiply our lives when we invest ourselves in another individual's life. Because we know that none of us can grow alone. We grow in a community, in the context of relationship. And how we pray that our church will really treasure that and really experience that on a daily basis as we grow together to be a vibrant church that reproduces vibrant churches locally and globally of disciple makers. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.